it's going to be on the mask. Well, good evening, everyone. I, um, I'm John Stewart, and I want to welcome you to the Miami Beach Urban Studios. This is, it's a wonderful thing to see you all here. We've been obviously missing our events um, uh, recently, or we've been doing them on, on Zoom. But uh, this is such a, a special occasion, and as you know, you're in a special place that you, we turn, we pause some of the um, 3D printers for you, but we have 60 3D printers. And uh, this place is, um, uh, we're, we're very closely aligned, and I'll just say, uh, for example, with um, the Takun Alam Making Group. We are the FIU's Takun Alam, make, Takun Alam Makers um, organization. We work with, um, you can see projects out there. We worked with the University of Miami. We worked with medical uh, institutions. We worked with Nicholas Health to find solutions through these 3D printers that are specific to people who don't have commercial applications that they can easily buy off the shelf. So we'll make a particular type of thing. So this this whole place, we work with the blind, we work with uh, Lighthouse, Miami Lighthouse for the Blind. So you're just in a special place where we hope to repair the world and we think that this, um, that this exhibition that Gary has put up every day that I go by it, it uh, repairs my world a little bit. So I want to thank you. And of course, I'm going to pass this over um, to Rebecca Friedman because Rebecca is really the reason that we're all here. and. Uh, through her, grand, her great grantsmanship and her enthusiasm and her vision, um, we're all able to be here together. So thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, John. Yeah. <laughs> this is so great, like John said, to see so many faces in person and to have so many people show up. So thank you. I'm Rebecca Friedman. I'm the founding director of the Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab at FIU. Um, and first thing I have to do is all my thank yous because so many people have been involved in this project. First of all, John Stewart, thank you for loaning <laughs> your space Don't to us. She's next to <laughs> right, right. I, I can't even Don't be you in know front of her. me? Come on. And Colette Mello, who did everything. That's yeah, what I was going to yeah. say. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Colette, you, who Colette. did everything. Seriously, who's made this an incredibly smooth project, one which really brings together different parts of FIU, various strings from strands from within the community, and so forth. So thank you to MBUS and the whole MBUS team. I also need to thank my own team because they're amazing. So I need to thank Enrique Rossell, who's back there taking photos. <laughs> See, we, don't, we don't get to do this on Zoom, so we're going to take every moment that we get to thank everyone. I want to thank Katie Coldiron, who is here. Also, um, and also Isabel Sands, who is here from the Wilsonian. These three are amazing. They make everything happen at the Public Humanities Lab. I also have to thank the Florida Humanities Council who, for their generous support of this project. Um, this is one of three events that we're having thanks to the Florida Humanities Council on the Refuse Next. And in some ways, although everybody is most of all, most of all, I want to thank Gary Monroe for his incredible creativity, for his collaboration, <laughs> and for really being the inspiration behind all of these events. So thank you for being here and for sharing your art with us, Gary. Now I'm simply going to introduce my, I, my colleague. I thank everybody in the panel, needless to say, but I, we're going to go in the order here. So I'm going to introduce my colleague, um, Professor Oren Steer, first of all. Oren, uh, Sear is the director of the Holocaust and Genocide Studies program and professor of religious studies in the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs at FIU. Um, and there he also directs the Jewish Studies Certificate Program. Oren and I have been colleagues forever, for a very, very long time, and he's made so much happen at, at FIU, and I'm so happy to have him as a colleague. He's also the author of two books and co-editor of a third. His research addresses Holocaust testimony, Jewish memory, Holocaust education, and the material and visual culture of the Shoah. He has been a Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies Fellow at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and was the guest curator, I remember this, he was the guest curator for a Wolfsonian teaching gallery exhibition, Race and Visual Culture Under National Socialism at FIU's Frost Art Museum in 2013. I remember, and I'll never forget this, all of the discussions about what to call that exhibit. That was, yeah, <laughs> that, was a, that was a thing. Um, last year, he served as the only university faculty member on a Florida Department of Education expert group writing new statewide standards for Holocaust education. 
Sear teaches and lectures widely on the memory and representation of the Shoah, as well as on issues of religion and violence in contemporary Jewish studies. So welcome and thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. It's wonderful to see this crowd here for, for Gary, for the work, and uh, for the uh, collaboration between the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab and uh, MBUS. And, and it's just amazing to see how many different units came together. So it's really thrilling. Um, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to put these photographs uh, and the story in context, right? This whole story of the refused Nicks, uh, who they were, why they matter, um, why it's relevant to us in South Florida, and how it really becomes a South Florida story. So I'm not going to steal the thunder from any of our distinguished panelists, um, who I will introduce um, one by one as they come up, so that we can get started right away. So our first speaker is going to be Ira Sheskin. Uh, he's the director of the Jewish Demography Project of the Sue and Leonard Miller Center for Contemporary Judaic Studies at the University of Miami. You maybe have heard of them. He's professor in the Department of Geography and Sustainable Development at the same institution. Uh, he teaches courses at University of Miami in survey research, research methods, statistics, Amer American Jewish demography and geography and political geography of the Middle East. He's been the co-editor of the American Jewish Yearbook since 2012, um, which documents the state of North American Jewry annually and has been published almost continuously since 1899. And I, I got to say that, you know, like when you're in grad school, it's like this is one of these things that you look at and there's like these dusty volumes that like line the shelves. I remember distinguishing, <laughs> looking at these in, at the Hebrew University actually in Jerusalem, they made it that far. Uh, he's uh, completed more than 50 major Jewish community studies for Jewish federations throughout the country, including Miami, Broward, Houston, St. Petersburg, I assume that's Florida, not Russia, <laughs> Omaha, Indianapolis, Detroit, uh, he's currently working on a study of the impact of COVID-19 for the UJA Federation of New York. Uh, he's been a consultant to numerous synagogues, Jewish day schools, Jewish agencies, Jewish nursing homes, Jewish community centers. He is a member of the National Technical Advisor Committee of the United Jewish Communities. Um, and uh, his publications include only about 60 monographs and books. I'm not going to name them all. I'd like to welcome, please, Dr. Iris Chesky. <laughs> Here. Okay, it, it's, uh, I'm really delighted to be here tonight. It's so good. This is the first in person public lecture I've done in about almost two years, I think, you know. And even though I've started to teach again in person, I only see half of my students, the half from the nose up, is what I say. <laughs> um, I'm here tonight to talk to you about uh, Jews in the United States from the former Soviet Union. and. We recently had a study completed by the Pew Research Center uh, in 2020, and that study estimated that there were about seven and a half million American Jews. Um, there are about, uh, there are 10% uh, of the adults, of the 5.8 million Jewish adults, were born in the FSU. So that's 580,000 adults. Assuming that 10% of the children, they did not ask where the children were born, okay, uh, were born to adults who were from the F FSU, that suggests about another 180,000 Jews from the FSU, most of whom are probably under 18. Giving us about 750,000 or so FSU Jews or their descendants um, in the United States. Thanks to the Greater Miami Jewish Federation and the Jewish Federation of Broward County, I did uh, major studies of the Jewish communities in Miami and in, uh, in Broward. Uh, we did ask where people were born. And of the interviews, 167 have at least one person born in the former Soviet Union. And there were 4,862 interviews with non-FSU households. So one of the things we're going to be able to do in this uh, little slide set we have here is we're going to be able to compare FSU households with uh, non-FSU households. And we're going to uh, start by doing a, just a few demographics and then look at the different ways that FSU Jews and non-FSU Jews relate to their Jewish identity. 
So we look here as one more piece of background. Uh, that's 1780 at the other end there, and this is uh, 2020. And this is the growth of the American Jewish population. Um, and I just want to take a look at the end of this right here. We were running about 6 million Jews in the country until about 1990, when we got this major influx of Jews from the former Soviet Union. Now, some came before then, some came after, but there was a, a surge at that point. And what I was able to figure out, since we're now at almost 7.3 million, it would appear as if about 60% of the growth in the U.S. Jewish population since 1990 is, in fact, Jews from the former Soviet Union. Okay. Let's take a look first at some demographics. In South Florida as a whole, we have about 12,000 people from the former Soviet Union, about 4,900 in Broward, 4,500 in Miami, and small numbers in West Palm Beach and South Palm Beach. The percentage of households is not very large. In Miami, about 3% of households are FSU households. And in Broward, it's about 2.2%. FSU households are younger uh, than non-FSU households. Notice there are fewer FSU households age 75 and over, uh, fewer age 65 to 74, and more children. We could look at this another way. FSU households are much more likely to have children in them than non-FSU households. They are much less likely to have elderly singles and much less likely to have non-elderly singles. So there's a difference in household structure as well. Income, let's just look at the bottom down here. For the FSU households, only 19% are making 100,000 plus. For the non-FSU households, it's just about uh, double that. It's a little more than double that at 39%. The median for SSU, FSU households is 52,000. For non-FSU households, it's 81,000. So the FSU households are younger, right? And they are also um, not as wealthy. Let's look next at some di issues having to do with Jewish community and connection. Um, Jewish identification. Of course, in the former Soviet Union, Orthodox conservative reform just Jewish meant nothing. Right? Everyone there was pretty much just Jewish and trying to, some trying to be religious. But these are the categories we use in the United States. So we have about 5% of FSU households saying that they're Orthodox. This is their own self-perception versus 8% for non-FSU households. Notice the big difference here is the 33% just Jewish here versus the 62% there. And of course, many of these former Soviet Union Jews grew up in an atmosphere where being Jewish was really solely an ethnicity. You really couldn't practice your religion very much. Many of them have continued that when they came to the United States. And so when asked, do you consider yourself Orthodox, conservative, reform, or just Jewish, over 60% answered that they're just Jewish. Emotional attachment to Israel. Let's take a look at being extremely emotionally attached. For the FSU household, it's half. For the non-FSU household, it's 28%. Many of the FSU households moved here, sometimes from Israel, they went to Israel first, ended up here. Many of them have relatives in Israel. Some of their family went there. Some of their family came here. So the emotional attachment to Israel is greater for your FSU households. We can look at some uh, home religious practices. And there is, has been this feeling, the people who haven't looked at the data, and that's why we collect data, that FSU households really aren't doing anything religious. And that turns out not to be the case. FSU here is in red, non-FSU FSU is in gray. They're just as likely to uh, always or usually participate in a Seder. They're actually slightly more likely to light Hanukkah candles, to have a mezuzah on the door is the same. Kosher home is the same. Now, having a Christmas tree is higher, but that's because in the former Soviet Union it wasn't a Christmas tree. It was a New Year's tree, and it kept up that uh, tradition. So in terms of home religious practices, which is what this one is, 
it's not like they're not doing the things that American Jews are typically doing. Membership, they are less likely to join a synagogue, but of course that goes together with the lower income. That's why I showed you that. They're just about as likely to be members of the JCC, although less likely to participate. Uh, they're just as likely to go to something that Chabad ran last year. They're less likely to be members of things like Hadassah and B'nai B'rith, an American Jewish community in ADL. Donated to a Jewish charity is again impacted by income. It's 38% versus 51%. Being very familiar with the Jewish Federation is about the same. They're more likely to have visited Israel, and the intermarriage rate is no different between FSU and non-FSU households. So what we found then is they're, they're younger, their income isn't as high, they're, they are more connected to Israel than non-FSU Jews. At their levels of religiosity, the Judaism part of being Jewish, is not much different than for the rest of our sample. And so I'll stop there, and we'll take some questions when the, when the time comes. Thank you. You know, we have a couple of minutes, so we could have a couple of oh, questions okay. right now and before I okay. introduce the next speaker. Please. I'll moderate if necessary. I couldn't see the What was the percentage of intermarriage? Oh, about one in five. Now, that means that um, one in five married couples in the Jewish community are intermarried couples. Right. That's called the couples rate. There's also something called an individual rate. And the mathematics behind that is not something that's really a topic. Has that changed in the last 50 years? What? In the last 50 years, is it consistently that around there or same? Uh, oh, it, it's it's been going up. Okay. But you know, in Miami, it's always been lower than the national numbers. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. So for the attachment to Israel, that interests me a lot. So when you ask the question, do you ask them why? Because I know you suggested it has to do with relatives or maybe coming to Israel as part of you know, the journey here. But I wonder if it doesn't also have to do with notions of nationalism and needing to identify with place, which is as a kind of holdover from the Soviet Union. The, the problem with asking why in a telephone survey oh, is okay. significant, oh, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have 5,000 interviews here, okay? Now, the next time the Miami Federation does a study, if you could add a half a million dollars to it, we can ask that question, okay? So you don't know. Yeah, that, that's, that's qualitative research for focus groups. Okay. I'm okay. a historian, so that's what we do. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just curious, you asked about political affiliation, Republican, Democrat, left, right. Yes, we did. Yeah. And <laughs> at the moment, I don't remember the answer to that, but I'll look it up for you, okay? Uh, we did in, we did not do that. We, some of the data are from as early as 2004. We didn't ask then, we asked it in 2016 in, in Broward and in 2014 in, my, in Miami. Um, but yeah, I mean, 75% of American Jews are Democrats and 25% are Republicans. And I do have some numbers here, and I'll look it up while uh, Bruce is talking since I've heard everything Bruce has to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I also wanted to just ask, I'm curious about the Refusenik issue, if you have any data on Jews from, you know, essentially before uh, the, the massive changes or, or after, if you have any sense for that shift. No, and okay. that's because um, when you have 20 minutes to keep people on the phone, one of the questions that didn't make it on is what year did you migrate to the United States? Oh. Okay. <coughs> I can come up with another 50 questions like that that you would say, oh, to. And that's <laughs> the problem with doing surveys is you have enough trouble keeping people on the phone for 20 minutes. There are a lot of good questions that, that, that we would like to have. The problem probably would have been anyway that let's say the vast, I suspect that the large majority of them came in 89, 90, 91 as the Soviet Union was falling apart. Right. So we had something like, let me go back to this slide right here, okay, we had 167 interviews here. Chances are, let's say 30 of them were from the early 80s. That's not going to be a large enough sample to look at anyway. And that's a consideration in what questions we ask. Are, we can ask the question, 
But if we're not going to pick up enough people who say, you know, in the early 80s, then we couldn't do anything with the information anyway. And that's one of the reasons I think that question didn't make it. Well, we're going to come back to Ira uh, at the end for a brief panel discussion. But right now, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so Bruce Udowitz recently retired after 14 years as the Chief Operating Officer of the Jewish Federation of Broward County. Among his major responsibilities was the Federation's strategic funding process for community services. From 1992 to 2007, he was the, the Director of Community Planning and Allocations for the Greater Miami Jewish Federation. Prior to that, he held senior professional leadership positions in three other Jewish federations. During his 45 years of professional experience as a Jewish communal professional, he worked on the local and national levels on issues regarding refuseniks and Jews from the former Soviet Union, including advocacy for immigration, migration, and resettlement issues locally and in Israel. He has a master's degree from the Hornstein Program of Jewish Communal Service at Brandeis University. Bruce Udowitz, please. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to answer a question that was sort of implied in one of Orrin's questions. So what is a refusenik? Yeah. Wait, excuse me? So what is a refusenik? So there are different groups of uh, Jews. So in uh, the late 1960s, Jews began to request the right to emigrate from the Soviet Union. And they were denied permission. And so that was where the term originated as a refusenik. You were not given permission to leave. Often that meant, even if they applied, whether they got permission or didn't, they, were, they lost their jobs, they were, um, their families were threatened, their, their livelihoods and their, um, their kids were attacked in schools. All kinds of repercussions uh, occurred, but they were refuseniks because they were not allowed to leave. And, whether, and, and they were applying to leave under Soviet law and under the International Human Rights uh, Convention which says that a person, that, that uh, the country cannot prevent fa people from re reunited with their families. So ref those were refused us. There were a whole other group of um, Soviet Jewish activists who were called prisoners of conscience. These are individuals who, many of them also were refuseniks, but these were people who in fact were imprisoned by the Soviet regime um, and um, interrogated and kept, and kept in long terms in prison, whether they were in the notorious prison in Moscow or in, uh, sent to Gul some of the Gulag camps uh, throughout the Soviet Union. Um, and then when you get later on and the Soviet Union started to liberalize and allow people to leave, then you no longer had people who were refuseniks and they were just, they were just part of a very large Russian exodus. So I want to focus a, a little bit on the period of time when we're talking about refuseniks. And they were really talking about the very late 1960s and the early, um, uh, through um, maybe the late 70s. After that, there you know, becomes a different kind of, of situation. So there are, there are three things. First of all, I want to make clear that while everybody had some common kinds of experiences. There were certain things that were common about it. There were a lot of things that were very individualistic for everybody. But on the other hand, they, were con they, they somehow fit into a common uh, pattern. Um, and, so there, and, and, and I think it's also to put, to put this in the context of, and I looked at it from the context and the, and the glasses that I wear, which was a Jewish communal professional who had to deal with the issues of both organizing the community around advocacy to allow Jews to leave the, the former Soviet Union, and also from the point of view of resettling Jews who chose whether they went to Israel because who raised the money that helped the state of Israel resettle um, these Soviet Jews but the American Jewish community, and also to deal with what was going to happen in the community. So those are the, the, the three kind of things. I'm, I'm probably not going to spend too much time on advocacy because one of the other um, sessions uh, of this series um, will deal with that. But I do want to talk about, because it, it does help frame the relationships 
that existed between people in the Jewish community who were here and the people who arrived from uh, the former Soviet Union. So first of all, advocacy began at really on a national level and became grassroots. And again, it was about, it was about a large story that became very personal. One of the remarkable things about the, the movement was in the, in the late 60s, you had an individual um, named Boris uh, Kochebievsky who decided that he was going to appeal to the Soviet leaders and then appeal to the UN to be allowed to leave the Soviet Union. And he was put on trial and he was imprisoned. And that, that began, as well as a whole bunch of other things, uh, began a whole process about um, internally in the former Soviet Union of Jews trying to seek and, and looking to go to Israel. And all of this was fueled by the, their reaction to the Six Day War and, and so forth. But I won't go into a lot of detail, but, but the reality was that in doing the advocacy, the national organization said, we can only get Congress, we can only get the President of the United States to do the things, to put the pressure on the Soviet Union to let Jews out if we have a grassroots national support system. And so it became very localized. And what happened in Florida, and you'll probably hear at, the next, at that other session about the South Florida Conference on Soviet Jewry, um, which became a national leader in helping people Go, to, go from the United States to go to um, the Soviet Union to visit with refuseniks, to provide them with material things that they could sell on the black market so they could survive through their um, uh, loss of job, provide religious materials, reading materials, give them hope, and then bring back their stories, their letters, and whatever they needed from the, from the Soviet Union. They became a compendium, I know I was not in South Florida at the time, but I would call them all the time to get information to share in part, which was part of the advocacy. So what became the mesh, what was successful about the advocacy was we were talking about a big problem, but about very personal people. And we knew we had pictures of them, we had stories about them, and that made it a very personal kind of thing, which, was, which enabled um, uh, us to really have a successful advocacy effort and go to build a very large coalition. I have to say that um, it was eye-opening for me as a young professional at the time to be working with leaders at the Catholic Church. Now, the Catholic Church was really, was really into this wholeheartedly. Um, it, was, you know, it was very strange, you know, but there are good reasons. But it was all about, but, but people, when we organized, there were pictures of these refusings. There were people um, talking about their stories to congressmen. Um, and that, made, that had a profound effect. But it had another effect. And that was it created a certain level of expectation that when people came here, that there was a level of, that we were going to get all the heroes. Okay? And, you know, you don't get the heroes. You get, you know, everybody else. They all had legitimate reasons to leave, but you don't get the, you don't, you don't get the, the, the stars. Um, there aren't enough to go around the country. Um, so, it, you know, that the expectations of who these people were and who were going to be coming to our communities had a lot to do with it. So you have that I issue of the advocacy. Then it, what had happened is in the 70s, there were, sm there were starts and stops of emigration. A few thousand a year were coming until 1979. 1979, 39,000 Jews from the former Soviet Union came to the United States. Um, and there was a, a larger number that, that were allowed to go to Israel. I remember, they were allowed to go because the Soviet Union was more comfortable allowing people to go to Israel, which was a state they didn't think was going to survive, and there was no, no psychological or ideological concern. But to allow people to go to the United States, um, their evil empire, um, that, was, that they couldn't tolerate and, and wouldn't tolerate. So, but many of them chose to come join family here or um, just drop out and not go to Israel because it was, they didn't know what they were going to get into. So there was a whole transmigration issue which the American Jewish community was involved in about how you help people get from the Soviet Union to either to Israel or the migration process from the Soviet Union to somewhere in Europe, usually either Vienna or outside of Rome, and then getting to the, to the United States. 
and there was a lot of support for that, and I won't go into a lot of detail on that. The last piece I want to talk, just sort of talk about, because again, we're framing some issues and creating context, was what happened when they came here? What happened in communities? And I see somebody, one of my friends came in, <laughs> who was directly involved locally in the, in the, in the resettlement of, of, um, uh, of Jews who came um, from the Soviet Union to, to Miami. And there was a whole process in many communities. You had lo the responsibility usually fell on the Jewish Family Service. In Miami, it started out with the National Council of Jewish Women. Um, but the, co the complexity of people coming to the United States, and remember, the people who are coming to the United States from the former Soviet Union came in as a status of refugee. That's a special legal status, which entitles them immediately to government funding, immediately to other kinds of government protections, um, and they can access Social Security, they can access, uh, some of them were able to access Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, um, and there was a refugee, there was a program that provided funding for refugees for the first few months to cover housing and, and, and other kinds of things. So, so in local communities, it became the, the, the responsibility of the Jewish Family Service. And um, also, many, in many cases, families were paired with local families. And that created, just like in the advocacy side, on this side, it created a personal relationship with individuals. And in some cases, that led to how those what those new Russian families saw, how to be successful Americans, was to be good Jews. Um, and in other cases, um, it was too difficult. It was too strange for them. I remember interviewing in 1973 two um, former refuseniks. Um, and they told me two things which I think are, are sort of symbolic of the, the challenge that they had. Uh, he told me that when he first arrived, when they left this former Soviet Union, they felt like they had jumped over a chasm, that they would never see their relatives again, that they would, don't even think they would be able to ever have contact with them again, and that there was no ever, slightest possibility of them ever going back to visit um, the, the place where they were born and raised. And the second thing was the culture shock of coming to the United States. I remember he told me when he said he, he went, and, and there are several parts of it, but one part in particular was that he went into a supermarket. Some, you know, one of his host family took him into a supermarket. Now, the, the, there, there's a whole bunch of jokes about the Soviet Union, and in those days, you went to the supermarket, and if you went for bread, you had no idea whether there was going to be bread or there wasn't going to be bread. If you had toothpaste on your list, you, knew, you didn't know whether there was going to be toothpaste. Or you might have, they might have said that there's going to be toothpaste this week, and they only had oranges. Um, and he goes into a supermarket, and what does he see? <laughs> goes to the, not only do they have bread, they've got all different kinds of bread. And then all different flavored, you have, you have white bread, and you have white bread with butter. And you have the, it, was, it was just so overwhelming. And then the other problem was that you're dealing with people, many of them originally, the first groups who came, were extremely highly educated professionals. And you come to a new community, you come to a place like the United States, where if you were a physician in the former Soviet, in the Soviet Union, that was a very high status job. Now you might have been a, um, um, a, a cardiologist, but all you knew about was cardiology. The United States, we require all of our medical students to learn something about the entire body. And they don't get to specialize until um, you know, sometime into, um, into their third or fourth years um, of medical school. So these are people that now had to take the, the, the med boards. They couldn't pass. So what happens? What do they do? All of a sudden, they're lab technicians. They're orderlies. Their only way that they can stay connected. It's a tremendous loss of status. Um, and so these were some of the challenges that we had. And then to complicate all of it is that we are Jews by religion. And I think we, Ira, you know, stated some of that. We are Jews by religion. 
they were Jews by nationality. And we have to remember, for three generations, they had no contact, unless they lived in the Baltic states, they really had no contact with Jewish life. They're, and they were separated not only, even though Yiddish was an official national language, there were no Yiddish schools, there were no opportunities for people to connect, there were no, there were no ways other than underground for people to connect Jewishly. And they're coming here, and we, we sort of um, presume, hey, they're Russian Jews, they're no different from those of us who came from Eastern Europe, they're no different from our grandparents who came in the 1900s here. Well, they were very different from them. And again, so some of that tension between the local community and the ability to absorb them. So in a lot of ways, it is very remarkable that this community and that the American Jewish community was able to provide the assistance, that this community still sees itself and its descendants see themselves, themselves as part of this Jewish community. And I think that that's a tribute to the fact that this was one of the few endeavors that we engaged in that was very person-centered. Thank you. So, Gary, if uh, Bruce was referring to you before, then you can't leave it until you talk. It was Renee I was referring to. Huh? It was Renee. I was it was referring. Renee. Okay. So <laughs> neither of you can leave. Um, you need to talk to Rebecca also. So, um, and uh, are, is there going to be an opportunity to take any oral histories at next, any point during this time. project? Next time. Okay. So. Um, I'll mention this later, but I'll also mention it right now that next week, uh, same bad time, same bad channel here, <laughs> 7 o'clock, we have the second of the three uh, uh, sessions in the series, which will focus on real live actual refuse mix. And individual stories. And individual stories. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, I want to make sure that we get a chance to ask uh, Bruce some questions, but um, we're going to keep up with the schedule. So I'm going to introduce our third speaker now. Um, uh, of course, it's Gary Monroe. Um, the, uh, a hometown uh, young man. Hero. Um, <laughs> hero. Hero. Speaking of heroes. Uh, upon completing graduate school at the University of Colorado in Boulder, Gary returned home to Miami Beach to photograph <coughs> South Beach's old world Jewish community daily for 10 years. When the Haitian boat lift of 1980, Mr. Monroe received unprecedented permission to photograph refugees in the INS Chrome resettlement camp. The media were barred. He ventured into Miami's little Haiti when others avoided the place. While baby Doc Duvalier ruled and before the media descended on Haiti, Mr. Monroe began photogra photographing throughout the beleaguered country. Then he photographed Haitian enclaves around Florida. And this is my favorite part. Because of his interest in tourism, in 1987 until 96 or something, uh, he began photographing tourist attractions. His, his, he photographed at Disney World hundreds of times in an attempt to make sense of its rite of passage through 2002. He subsequently photographed Florida's older theme parks and his interest expanded to include other countries, Israel, England, Spain, Mexico, Brazil, Cuba, Poland, and India, to name a few. He continued photographing throughout Florida with a special interest in describing corporate-driven landscapes. I don't know if we're in one right now. Um, he's got a, uh, uh, a huge archive of 12,500 rolls of film, twice as many large prints. Um, he continues to prowl streets nearby and far away with his Leica M cameras and print the negatives in his doubt room. His, his photography has been supported by numerous grants and without much further ado, Jesus. Gary Monroe. Thanks, I also just want to say it's my second time to have Gary at an FIU institution and, ha and see his work, and it's just such a thrill. Thank you, Oren. Oh, well, first of all, thank you, Colette and John. And um, I could not have asked for a better collaborator than Rebecca and her mom, who's not here tonight. And um, your staff is absolutely amazing. It's a pleasure to meet uh, Enrique and Katie this afternoon. And I want to introduce Jorge Zamanillo, the director of History Miami, who made that into a, a world-class museum. <clears throat> and of course, you're probably all familiar with Maurice Cohn Ban, the ex-Miami Herald photojournalist, who's been a Girl Scout troop leader for, 30, for 40 years. In his house, I stay at when I'm here. And um, as you know, my friend and collaborator, Andy Sweet, um, his sisters, Ellen and Nancy, are here. Thank you for. And, and, 
and a, a real life refused Nick was here, although Angela was seven when I photographed her. And unfortunately, her mom, who's one of my favorite people ever, is ill. So you can identify her picture, I think. You look the same. And that's a, um, can I, can move am I, are you going to do that? Yes, I Okay, can. thank you. Um, what I, I put together, not photographs of refused Nick's because some of them are here and there's another 20, I think, in the archive. Um, but very quickly, I, I have boxes and boxes of large prints and I came across these just about a year and a half ago. I hadn't seen them in years. And I just, re it just resonated, you know, what a lost epoch that was overshadowed by the Marielito, the boat lift from the Port of Mariel, followed by the, um, the Haitian boat lift um, in 1980. And I thought that this was lost history. And I, I asked a lot of people who I should work with, and that's when I got Rebecca's name. So it's been just a charm and to be associated with people like Oren and the rest of the FIU and University of Miami staff has been a delight. And we're just getting started with this project. So what I did is pulled photographs, um, not of, of um, Refuseniks, but of South Beach, because I have the sense that really few people know the history of South Beach. We were sitting, Lisa and George and I were sitting um, in front of Books and Books, which is no longer there. And, um, <laughs> and um, I was watching people walk by, and I'm just saying, you know, beautiful people, but clueless as to what they're walking through and across. So for more context, um, oh, can we turn the, is Colette, did she leave me again? Yeah. Can we turn the lights out? Because I'll look a lot better yeah. if it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Colette. As dark as you're comfortable making now. This, yeah, this one. So I was born in Miami Beach at Mount Sinai Hospital. And when I was born, we used, our parents were given a certificate from the, the then mayor. So that's, that's proof of my existence right there. <laughs> 1951, and that's my full name. OK, next slide. I'll pull my ear on it. OK, you pull your ear <laughs> And uh, this is my, my family, and I'm the little one. This was at the uh, Fleetwood Hotel which was one of three um, Carl Fisher hotels below um, Lincoln Road. The other was um, um, the Flamingo, which is now the Flamingo Apartment Houses. It became Morton Towers, now it's at Flamingo. And the Fleetwood Hotel, which is on 8th Street and West Avenue. This is at the foot of MacArthur Causeway, and um, it became a halfway house when I photographed there um, after grad school. Okay, please. That's my father and his bar mitzvah in New York. And, um, <laughs> Next, please. And that's me at the Clevelander Hotel. Every summer, my father was a self-employed businessman. So every summer, he and he loved the sun for his psoriasis. So every summer, he would um, rent two rooms at the Clevelander. And um, that's me, where it was a bar. <laughs> that's my first date and my last date. So, <laughs> Lisa, I forget her name. That's Lisa, I know. <laughs> and that's a picture Andy took of me. Um, when we were photographing in South Beach. And of course, by that time, South Beach became a last refuge for elderly um, Eastern European Jews. And it was sort of shunned. I mean, I had buddies in New York that wouldn't visit me. Why would we want to go to South Beach, where I lived? And um, politicians called it um, God's waiting room or a gerontological ghetto. There was very little interest and respect paid. But I got it when I went to undergrad school that there was something really a, a very precious legacy that was vanishing. So I said, I'm going to dedicate 10 years to photographing. And I did it 10 years to the day, and I'll explain why 10 years worked. This is a book University Press have published, University Press of Florida published last year. And that's the photograph. Full frame, not cropped. Mm -hmm. I've never cropped a photograph. <laughs> so um, you, there were three exercise groups that met every morning. This was Rose Silverman's class which met on 3rd Street and Ocean Drive. There was a lot of life, a lot of jo very jovial, and there was a lot of suffering too. Okay, please, John. And um, look a little burned out, but um, Loomis Park back then, there were no young people there, period, except for Andy and me. And I would wander around, and um, back then there was no hotel security, so you could walk in and out from the pools through the lobbies. I think that was the Royal Palm Hotel, which is just by the Lowe's down the street. And that's, um, anybody remember Thrifty Supermarket? Leave me. <laughs> that, that's the wall on Thrifty's. It was a real uh, establishment. And <clears throat> the hotels, when they were built in the 30s and 40s, um, were a bit more glamorous. And they had um, card rooms and social halls, but there was really not much of a need for those. 
in the 19, um, later 60s, 70s, and 80s. So many of the hotels let their residents transform the um, social halls and card rooms into makeshift synagogues. And um, that's, I think, on 14th Street and Collins Avenue. I'm not sure where that is. And every Tuesday and Friday, the Torah came out. Um, it was pretty phenomenal. Washington, and Link, Link, that's across the street, Lincoln Road and off Washington Avenue. It was a, it was a very vivacious community. And there was a senior citizens orchestra that met at the Sixth Street Community Center. And they were also very politically motivated. Um, the politicians only came to South Beach um, when they want, when there's an election coming up. And they would, um, I think it was Commissioner Weinstein, friend of Andy's father, um, would give out cups of, uh, Dixie cups of vanilla ice cream um, <laughs> to, to buy for votes. But these people were very dedicated because they lived through so much. They lived through the Holocaust. And it wasn't unusual to see people with tattooed numbers on their forearms, please. And again, this is in Flamingo Park. And I, I, I was asked about this years ago. Somebody was looking for the photograph. Um, I think it was a socialist group that would meet there and um, have weekly meetings. And this, I, I must have photographed in 200 hotel rooms and apartments back then. This was below Fifth Street. And she kept this painting of Hitler as the angel of death covered by a sheet in her living room. And of course, this was a, the hotel, the Essex Hotel on um, 10th and um, Collins. And of course, they, tr they tr made that um, card room into a little synagogue. And they're, they're praying in the morning facing east. Sukkot, they were building them in front of many of the hotels on the sidewalk. And there was, um, you know, you can see the, Yid the um, Hebrew. Um, it was just a very strong presence of ultra-Orthodox ultra as well as conservative <coughs> Jews. There must have been 20 temples between First Street and yeah. Dade Boulevard. And I used to get up early, <coughs> still do, and um, there was this wonderful phenomenon of these people going to the beach before the sun rose. They'd walk from their hotels or apartments, and they'd enter the water just as the sun rose. And it was absolutely gorgeous to watch. But that came to an end in 1980, because believe it or not, back then, South Beach was amongst the least expensive real estate in Dade County. So um, a, lot of the, um, a lot of the criminally minded would migrate to South Beach and made it unsafe for them to wander out um, in the dark. <clears throat> that and the US Army Corps of Engineers added 200 feet of sand from churned up Carl Rock, which made it too far for many of them to want to walk to the water's edge. But Loomis Park, the grassy area of Ocean Drive, was where the social um, happenings took place daily. And this is an exercise group that met in a bank, and there were many of these throughout South Beach. This is 10th Street Auditorium, where they had the Hot Meals program. I think this was before that. These are from 1977 through 86. <coughs> The Blackstone Hotel, the Pink Hotel on Washington Avenue. And Washington Avenue is not like it is today. Every store was um, active and alive. And this was um, in front of, I forget what, Lundy's Grocery Store, I think on 13th or 14th in Washington Avenue. This is a classic Richard's, I guess it must have been on a weekend or too early. Uh, that was an uh, open air fruit um, stand. This is by the, um, the, the temperature. The, out, the um, hotel on 10th and the Astor Hotel, 11th and, um, Call and Washington. But you see, there's no young people anywhere in sight, except Andy and me, <laughs> when I woke them up in the morning to, <laughs> to get out of bed. And I, I, just, I just heard the term for the first time about four or five years ago. They were calling them porch sitters. But um, that's what they would do. They would sit and just watch the world go by, have conversations, often in Yiddish. And um, it was actually a very pleasant way to age for all, the, all they lived through. This is a tram that used to uh, travel up and down Lincoln Road. I think it was ten, a nickel or 10 cents. And believe it or not, this is at the Mammy Beach Nursing Home, which became Mangoes. Oh. Yeah, go, it's quite a juxtaposition, huh? Along, um, along Loomis Park, please. 
I think it's in the Doedo Hotel on Lincoln Road and Collins. But it was just nonstop photographing for all those years. And the people loved it because um, I was like their, everybody's surrogate grandson. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no taboos. I mean, I was invited into rooms and see how I live, and it was pretty phenomenal. And there was a sense of despair with many people. Um, there were rumors of people eating dog food, which I never substantiated, and a lot of hard luck stories about how children dis disowned their parents. And But by and large, it was um, a, a healthy place. And, and many of the um, social agencies did a great job in caring for the, for the people, the residents there. My prints look much better than they're projecting here. So. <laughs> As I said, I was just everywhere. And that's in Flamingo Park. That's the Miami Beach Nursing Home, 55th wedding anniversary. Ooh. I know, with onlooker, huh? <laughs> and I, you might notice they, they have sea grape bush leaves in their mouths. And it was very common, it was to protect their lower lip from sunburn. <coughs> cheaper than um, zinc oxide, excuse me. <laughs> I also photographed the west side of um, South Beach where the um, larger apartments are and a bit more affluent. Now, so there was that, el that element of um, loneliness and aging. Oh. Yeah, and it was coming to an end. Andy and I, <clears throat> every year we would um, we would photograph New Year's Eve parties, and we started five thirty in, in the afternoon because when the parties started, <clears throat> they were all often over at eleven. But um, <clears throat> it was my bar barometer, excuse me, my barometer of, of the health of South Beach. And in about nineteen eighty four, the parties tailored off; they weren't as much fun. And by eighty six, there was only three left, whereas the first five or seven years, there were probably 200 parties, one for every hotel on Ocean Drive and Collins, even on Washington Avenue. And I went back, I think, 88, and there was one party, and it was, it was like lackluster. And not everybody was a fan. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> These are from some of the um, New Year's Eve parties now. They were given um, a box dinner. It's actually much more jovial than my photographs to look. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. But I mean, they, they, what fascinated me <clears throat> was that they um, were more celebratory than I was, more optimistic. They didn't have any fears of their aging, or they didn't show any. And they really lived their lives fully. <laughs> this is um, one of the Refusenik photographs. I don't know how I got involved with them. I don't think, the, I don't know if it was the Federation that oriented me, or the Workman's Circle on 2nd and Washington. I don't think I need to go back far enough to remember Miriam Zatinsky, who was a director there, but she was very helpful with um, getting me access, and she might have been the ones to introduce me to the families. And this was a, I'm going to go a little bit outside of my South Beach work, because it's gotten so much attention that I, I don't want to be seen as a one-trick pony, but um, this is what started me off with the Haitians. There were, I was photographing those three people, and this Haitian um, immigrant glided by, and I started thinking, you know, I'd been photographing the endings of this 100-year lineage um, story, <coughs> and now I can photograph the beginning. So I went, <coughs> I went to the um, Metropole Hotel on 6th Street in Collins, and it was a hotel that was occupied exclusively by Hasidic Jews almost every season. And this season, the, IN, the government rented the entire hotel to house the overflow of Haitian refugees. And I asked the manager if I could hang out here, and he said, help yourself. And I, I made a, a lot of photographs there for, I don't know, a few weeks. And then as I learned more, um, I got the urge to go to the INS Chrome detention camp, which is on Chrome Avenue, west of FIU, which back then was like in the Everglades. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. now there's, and um, I'll get back to that in a second. But I photographed at Chrome Camp when it was off limits to Miami Herald because the camp director, Cecilia Ruiz, um, got what I was doing, that I wasn't a journalist and I wasn't 
documenting anything that I didn't, I wasn't going to cause problems with my photographs. I was just an artist doing my work, and he gave me free access to Chrome Camp. And just before I did that, I started to hang out in Little Haiti, and back then I was the only blonde, the only white person in Little Haiti. Uh, people were afraid of Haitians, you know, they were blamed for the AIDS thing, and um, it was totally untrue. And it was, I, I, I contextualized it as a poor man's coconut grove. Um, it was kind of laid back, bungalows, no trees though. And um, I was hanging out there for about a year or two and um, being more fascinated by the Haitians manner. These are Haitians. Um, I, I started to travel to communities throughout South and Central Florida. I think that's Fort Pierce. And then I went to Haiti and um, this is my first day there. I, I flew in on an Eastern jet and um, they couldn't open the cargo doors. So I had to go like, back the next morning and um, I stayed in Port-au-Prince and I went back the next morning and um, I'm overhearing this lady with four or five people with her talking about a, a missionary place that they built and I'm, I'm just eavesdropping and she looks at me and I look at her and she says, do you want to join us? And I said, hell yeah. <laughs> you know? So um, we drove that night in a tap tap that she had um, made arrangements for, like a jitney, and um, up the um, mountains past, like, past Cap Haitian to a place where it's just lost in time. We got there at midnight and I got up at sunrise and I thought I was on Venus. But it was, wow. <laughs> it was pretty year? fascinating. Hmm? What year is that? At 84, 1984, it was under a Fulbright. And then I just was, um, I just fell in love with Haiti. And there was no photographers, no photojournalists going there then. And um, so I was just wandering around doing my thing like always. And this is in downtown Port-au-Prince. Then I was staying at a pension in Jacques Mel and I hear a little noise at 6.30, 7 o'clock, whatever it was, on a Sunday morning, and I went to the balcony, and everybody's going to church, very lyrically. Then I was, oh, tr Andy and I traveled around Florida a lot, and um, we just go aimlessly anywhere. And I remember once we were driving down that road in front of the school, it's in the panhandle, and it dead-ended in a forest, like a great, and we make it turn around, and we're driving back, and drive past the school, and at three o'clock school bell rings, so I said, I don't know who was driving. We pulled over and um, I just started photographing. I made what I consider to be a lovely photograph, just very decisive. And uh, but that was, that, that was you know, 30 some odd years ago. You can't view that today, of course. Don't try it. <laughs> and then of course, um, 1980 with the Mario Boltwith, under I-95, there was a tent city, which is where that was taken. And then I photographed when we relocated to Deland, the Montessori school building their own gardens. And then I photographed some, no, this is all, I think all of Miami. That's Purvis Young and the Maisel brothers with Chris Dill. I was on the island, Pavarotti, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and Helen Muir, um, Gary Winogrand, the great photographer. Ed, who's that at the top right? Gabriel Cabrera and <laughs> And? On the left. Ed, come on. Pedro Almodovar. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> It's my, it's our yeah. film, our film story. There's tons of these photographs. This is I'm traveling the state. It's a baptism in Clearwater, Florida. Florida's a great state. This is a recent. My my framer um, says, you know about the um, the cowboy shoot up or whatever it was called, fat fast draw. And that these grown ups that dress as cowboys and they have these contests as to who can draw their six gun. <laughs> it's a great state. Then I went to Israel. Um, I think it was the Israeli embassy, they, they did a thing for Jerusalem 3000 and they commissioned me to spend a few weeks in Jerusalem. I was looking for the trees planted in my name but I couldn't find a one of them. <laughs> and Poland, just travels about Mexico, so I'm still working. <laughs> and this is a couple of years ago in St. Petersburg, Russia. And these are some of the refuse nicks. We can go through these too. And again, they all wound up in South Beach hotels, and um, I don't—I just don't remember how I had access to them. But it was—it um, was interesting, more interesting today. So one of our goals is to try to identify the people, and I thought that the Federation might have files, but it's been what 40 years now. We're in it for two generations deep, so.
Your last one. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe we could have some, thank you. So we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, I especially know that uh, 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 Bruce didn't get a chance to get any yet, and also I'm sure people have questions for Gary. I'd like to invite um, all of our panelists up here, and uh, we, we can take a few minutes. Um, and um, uh, other than that, uh, afterwards, I'm sure everybody also wants to go see the exhibition. But uh, come on up. Um, are these mics, do they need to be? Uh, those mics are kind of, yeah, located where we thought. So let's, so why don't, don't we, why don't we gather be, over here? You, that would be fine. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't, I don't need to be. I need, uh, I need directions. <laughs> okay, so questions, comments, yes, please. Bruce? Very good question. So just briefly, I single out the Baltics because the Baltics were not part of the Soviet U Union until World War II. So institutions that existed in the Baltics, in Lithuania and so forth, existed until the Nazi occupation. So they were not that. And you're right about the difference between Asiatic Jews in the, Soviet, in the former Soviet Union. Again, as, they, as you were away further from the periphery of Moscow, um, and Leningrad, you, you, um, there was greater autonomy in some of those. Um, those, those and, and I think, though, that most of the focus of the refuseniks, vast majority of them, were people who were coming from the, the western part of the, of the former Soviet Union, from the Russian Republic, from Belarus, from, from the Ukraine. So, and, and that was a, that's, that's a, clearly an Ashkenazi um, thing, and we can go into to, to that. The second thing um, you, you asked about is, is in terms of the integration of, of, of the community. So for instance, South Florida um, did not have a very large settlement. As a matter of fact, there were only two communities in the state of Florida in the, eight, in the 1980s and 90s that were resettling Jews from the former Soviet Union, Miami and Jacksonville. And Jacksonville, interestingly enough, the resettlement was being done by Lutheran Social Services. Um, there's a whole story behind that and about their Jewish director who was doing that. But, but um, there, you know, but but really in South Florida, it was only the Miami um, Jewish community. Um, and again, the, the 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 few numbers that came, they an agreement was made. Highest was the intermediary that brought them to the United States. Highest then contacted the local Jewish Family Service, and then each in each community and in Miami they did it, you know, through the Jewish Family Service, and then they brought in, um, you know, people who worked with the with these families. So, and unlike the Cuban community, the Cuban Jews who came here, who came in a larger number at a single time, um, uh, there they weren't as visible in the community. Um, and, and, and again, there were also issues, there was greater need for financial support 
They were totally dependent. These are people who came with no financial resources. So, you know, so some of that is, 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 is what was different. It wasn't until the, the 1980s and, early, and certainly the 1990s, because I can talk about because I came to the Miami Federation in 1992, and one of the first things that I was involved in was helping figure out a financial formula to enable the children of the former Soviet Union uh, families that were here go to day school. And so the community was very good about you know, giving them breaks in the first year, but the problem was all of a sudden they now have to pay tuition. What are they, who, they never heard of paying tuition, and certainly the amount of tuition for a private day school um, is, is very expensive. So we came up with a cockamamie formula that we would give the schools more money to keep their kids, the kids for the second year and diminish it in the third and fourth year with the idea that by that time, you know, usually for a, a, an immigrant family, um, and this is well documented in the, throughout the United States, it takes about 10 years to get close to financial proximity to their native um, uh, um, um, contemporaries. And, um, you know, so the first three or four years before they're established, before they have a regular job, you know, they can't afford to pay those kinds of things. And, and so, you know, that was part of what the Jewish community um, did. I hope that addressed your question. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have a question about how you were Okay, sure. All right, please. Yeah, let me answer the question about uh, politics. Um, I look, it's amazing how I can get anything on my home computer right here. Um, more likely to be Republican than our non-FSU Jews. Um, but of course, that's only Miami data. Everything here you were looking at was Miami and Broward. I just about three weeks ago got the Pew 2020 data set from, the new, from their new survey. Uh, there's 400 Russian Jews in there, okay? Uh, we could do a great analysis. I started to do it and then realized that they told me I couldn't make any public until after Thanksgiving. So after Thanksgiving, if you really know the answer, Email me after Thanksgiving and I'll let you know <laughs> for nationwide, okay? Yeah. But here in Miami, the percent, it's a small sample, that's why I'm, I'm not giving out numbers. The percentage Republican is, is somewhat higher. Of course, you know, when you look at Hispanics in this community, those who left uh, uh, kind of a socialist regime, uh, regime like the folks in Venezuela also tend to associate more with the Republican Party for the same reason that the Russians. Uh, I have been in contact with some younger Russian Jewish groups, and I've seen some articles that suggest uh, that the second generation, their first generation was Republican, the second generation is tending more toward a Democrat than their parents. And of course, some of that's related to the fact that lots of people like to do something different from their parents, right? Mm -hmm. so. I think we'll take one uh, last question. Uh, yeah, please. generations one on the two sides on the in the two groups and how they vary uh, and if By that's age. maybe a function yeah the younger ones across the two categories and then all and also the general view across two categories okay. but also as a function of whether they have visited the state of Israel or not um, if there's no more time I had a lot of like the question to, to so the I, let yeah, me answer that before I forget it. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and I'd like to respond to it. Okay, sure. You start out with 146 FSU Jews, and now you want me to break them down by age and whether they've been to Israel or not. Okay, so I can tell you about the three people who fit in each category. Yeah, I, that that just can't be done. But I can answer that question in a more general way. There is an enormous amount of research on whether younger Jews are less attached to Israel than older Jews are. And the answer is yes. 
The answer is also that that's been the case since the 1950s. Younger Jews have always been less attached than older Jews. But the older Jews today were the younger Jews in 1950. So apparently what most people seem to think is that younger people are less likely to say they're extremely or very attached to Israel. But when they get older, they start saying it. Well, and, and, and I would like to add to that because, sure. because we don't have enough data yet on the impact of things like birthright. And there are a lot of second generation and young Russian Jews who have been on er birthright trips to Israel. And we don't know what that impact is, and especially because Israel, because Israel resettled over a million Jews from the former Soviet Union. Um, the impact of Russian Jews in Israel is far greater and far vi more visible. And that, I think, also has an impact on people who visit, particularly Russians who visit Israel. So there, there's a lot of things. And, and this was sort of like my closing comment. Again, like I said before, there are a lot of personal stories. And there are a lot of things that are different and unique about each person. And yet there are some general trends. There are a lot of things that I would love to sit down with a faculty and say, here's about six, 600 research projects that I could suggest on, 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 on this whole experience. Remember, the experience for most of American Jewry became, became aware of it in the, in the mid to late 1960s. But there was a lot of work that was going on both in Israel and here about pushing for the rights of, of Jews in the former Soviet Union, whether it was to be able to bake matzah, it was to be able to um, uh, have schools, to the idea of, of immigration. And there was a process. And, and I had a, a mentor who was the national guru on public policy issues around um, Jews in the former Soviet Union. And he, he said that, and this was, this was 50 years ago, is it 40 years ago? He said, this is going to be a problem. This is going to be an issue we're going to be dealing with for the next 40 years. And the 40 years were over, and it's going to be something in a very different way, but it's something we're going to be dealing with always. And, it, and by the way, this applies to every, every, every group, every migratory group. So I'm, I'm I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up. Uh, uh, you, my father always says you always have to leave something for the next time. So um, uh, we're going to reconvene here uh, in one week. I uh, please uh, uh, invite everyone to come back. The title of next week's session is. We can't remember, but let's we, call it stories. We call it. We can't remember, but let's call it stories. And also, yeah. please, uh, please, please look at the, the beautiful photographs um, and uh, uh, introduce yourselves to each other. Uh, thank you again to, to John and Colette and uh, Miami Beach Urban Studios. Thank you to the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab, all the other co-sponsors, Hughes Museum of Florida, uh, Florida Humanities Council, and of course to our speakers, Ira, Bruce, and Gary. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you.